Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today. We are going to be focusing on 2 Samuel chapters 5 through 7 and 11 through 12, along with 1 Kings 3, 8, and 11. We'll cover a lot of material here, but we're only going to focus on a few highlights. That is, we're going to talk about studying the ark, we're going to talk about switch points in life, and not giving in to our greatest temptations. 2 Samuel, if you do like a little word map of it, and the more a word is written in the, in the book, you know, with these, the larger the word is. You can tell King David is the focus of what we're going to be studying in the first half of today in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel just gives that history of King David. King David starts off 2 Samuel with a series of wars including a very brutal civil war. And in chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, all the elders came to the king to Hebron, and King David made league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was only 30 when he began his reign, and then after that he reigns for 40 years. So a very long reign. Later on, chapter 5, he goes to Jerusalem, which is a stronghold of time, he takes it, and that becomes his city. He moves his capital to Jerusalem. And at that time, he realizes in Jerusalem, we're missing something, something that we'd like to have back in our presence. And we have to go back to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, you may remember, the Ark of the Covenant gets captured, and they have it in someone's house. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, and the men of Kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the Ark of the Covenant and brought it into the house of Benadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the Ark of the Lord. Well, there's a picture of that, that many years ago. That's the hill on top of it and now rests a church. But I just kind of picture myself, if I was in that home, home wasn't probably that big, and I could just picture the Ark of the Covenant just sitting there in the front room. And I'm just thinking, okay, it's going to be there for 20 years. What would I find out about the Ark of the Covenant? I mean, for me, if I have the Ark of the Covenant in my house, I would become an expert on it. I would know all the stories behind it. I'd be asking people, okay, remember when? Telling them, what else do you know? At this time, they know where the Ark is, and they're going to go get it. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 2. And David arose, and with all the people that were with him, from Baal of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. I could be just as a great, great event. Now, the ark was a symbol of God's presence, his glory, his majesty. When first given to Israel, the ark was placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, and not even the priest was allowed to approach it. Only the high priest, a type of Christ, could approach it, and then only going through an elaborate ritual of personal cleansing and propagation, or remaining in God's favor by repenting of his sins. So, now I'm just back to that thought. If it's been in my house 20 years, would I have made time? Of course I would have. What would I have taught my children about the ark? Maybe some things I would have taught my children is it was where the presence of God was. It was the mercy seat. In the tabernacle, it was where the cloud over the day rested. It was symbolic. God is in our presence in day. And a pillar of fire by night. God was there because that in the Holy of Holies, where the Ark Covenant was, in the, is the intersection of heaven and earth in Jewish belief. And so... As it represents the presence of God, I would have taught that to my kids. I would have taught them about mercy seat and how it, Christ would be the atoning for us and how sacred it was for Israel. And I'd also say, remember, here's why it's in our home. And it's a resting place. Philistines couldn't handle it. They had a lot of plagues. It's kind of like, we don't want this anymore. But also, back to the war where the people said, hey, we're getting our rear ends kicked. Go get the Ark of the Covenant. And if it's in front of us, then we won't be defeated. And they went and had the Ark of the Covenant. They relied only on the Ark of the Covenant and not in their faith in God. 
And God says, no, you have to be personally righteous for things like this to work. They had forgotten that personal righteousness precedes power. Well, I probably should have known that, like in this picture or this one, the only ones who could carry the Ark of the Covenant were priests. I wonder what would have happened if in this home that would have been taught. I'm not sure it was. Because when David comes to get the Ark, Abinadab and his sons, Uzzah and Ahio, decide, well, we're going to make a new cart. Not going to have the priest come and pick it up, but let's make a brand new cart because we're going to show respect. We don't have it to be any dirty. Let's make a new cart and put it up on there. And I'm sitting here thinking, first, these two young men shouldn't even be there. They shouldn't be carrying the cart. Ark should be the priests that were sent from God. If they wouldn't have even been there, that thing won't happen to one of them. Well, chapter 6, verse 6, 2 Samuel, And they came to Natchez's threshing floor, threshing floor, got it on the third time. It's a bump. You come to the threshing floor, you got a bump. And Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And I thought, pausing right here, if the priests would have been carrying it, this never would have happened. If, maybe in the home, it would have talked about this is the presence of God. It's sacred. We're forbidden to touch it. Or maybe reminded, maybe this wouldn't have happened. But I think Uzzah's uh, idea here is just well-meaning. I'm not sure he knows all the way. But the ark looks like it may tip over. I'm going to grab a hold of it and steady it. Maybe a little bit because of his ignorance. And verse 7, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him for his error, and he died by the ark of God. Elder Neely Maxwell just talks about one lesson we can learn. And maybe it's the obvious one. Some may reason that Uzzah was only trying, though mistakenly, to help out. But given the numerous times the Lord had saved and spared Israel, including the high dramas of the Red Sea and the manna from heaven, surely he, the Lord, knew how to keep the ark in balance. President David O. McKay applied the Ark of the Covenant lesson story to us in this way. It is a little dangerous for us to go out of our own sphere and try to unauthoritatively direct the efforts of a brother. You remember the case of Uzzah, who stretched forth his hand to steady the ark. He seemed justified when the ark stumbled in putting forth his hand to steady that symbol of the covenant. We today think his punishment was very severe. Be that as it may, the incident conveys a lesson of life. Let us look around us and see how quickly men who attempt unauthoritatively to steady the ark die spiritually. Their souls become embittered, their minds distorted, their judgment faulty, their spirits depressed. Such is the pitiable condition of men who, neglecting their own responsibilities, spend their time in finding fault with others. And I just, some thought questions with this story. Just thinking about what the consequences are of seeking to steady the ark, or trying to direct or correct church leaders. And I pause, I've seen that over the last few years. I think I've seen that quite a, not quite a bit, occasionally, but it's been consistently. Whatever the reason, they want to reach out and correct church leaders. And I've watched what's happened to them. They seem to have their moment of fame. They're two minutes on the news. Maybe it's 30 seconds. And then I don't ever hear from them again. And maybe that's just me and my circles. What principles can we learn from the account of Uzzah? And maybe one for me, and this is just me, is as a father in Israel, in my home, I need to teach my, my children and my grandchildren the thoughts of what's sacred, the thoughts of things that matter to God, and pass that along. This is holy. Let's treat it with respect. How are people today trying to correct or direct God's work, even though they lack the authority to do so? I don't know of very many leaders, if any, that wouldn't welcome a suggestion. As a bishop, I had individuals in my ward that would come up to me, Bishop, have you considered this? And quite frankly, most times I was like, no, I hadn't. I was grateful for their advice and counsel. But I don't feel like I had anybody come up and want to steady the ark. 
and correct in a way like Uzzah did. But I will add that sometimes, like in a Sunday school class, you may get somebody who has studied the ark in the past and kind of wants to brag about it. I remember when, and I said this and I was right. So how do you respond to someone who's justified their past studying of the ark? And my two cents with love and kindness. And if you have that relationship with them, go up to them and just say, I love you, but I don't think it was all that bad. Time to move on. Well, chapter six, David's pretty excited. He starts to dance. Verse 14, got that Ark of the Covenant, and David danced before the Lord with all of his might. It's a dance with all of his might. And David was girdled with a linen ephod. And they brought it all up, and there's trumpets, and you can kind of tell. Now, I just love the imagery here. He was girded with a linen ephod. David taken off his royal robes and put on a plain robe. A plain robe that maybe is signifying that I want to show Israel, even though I'm king, I'm also the servant of the Lord. This was not the ephod. It was worn by a high priest made of a different material. But it's plain, and the ephod of the high priest is finely woven, maybe a, a silk or a satin, nice clothing. Well, as David comes in, he's not wearing his kingly apparel. Verse 20, David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, and this is sarcastically, you may have to do this in a sarcastic kind of voice, how glorious the king of Israel was today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaid of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Micah feels David abased himself. Kind of was like these common people. He's a king. He should be up here. And you're, you're just saying you're one of the other people who loves and serves the Lord. When the ark came or was carried in the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and there she saw King David leaping and dancing before Jehovah and despised him in her heart. Michael is intentionally designated as the daughter of Saul here instead of the wife of David because on this occasion she manifests her father's disposition rather than her husband's. In Saul's time, people did not trouble themselves about the Ark of the Covenant. Public worship was neglected, and the soul for vital religion had died out in the fam family of the king. In David, Michael only loved the brave hero, the exalted king. She therefore took offense at the humility in which the king, in his pious enthusiasm, placed himself on equally with all the rest of the nation before the Lord. This proud daughter of Saul was offended at the fact that the king had let himself down on this occasion to level the people. She availed him herself of the shortness of the priest's shoulder dress to make a contemptuous remark concerning David's dancing as improprietary that was unbecoming in a king. With the words, Who chose me before thy father and all his house? David humbles the pride of the king's daughter. His playing and dancing referred to the Lord, who had chosen him and had rejected Saul on all account of his pride. Now, that was a long quote. Sometimes our leaders have fun. And it's a great thing that they show that they're just one of us. Sometimes they do things that we love to do too. I don't know if they're good at it or bad at it. But it's wonderful to have a leader who loves us and laughs with us and smiles with us and does righteous things with us. Just a great way to look at a prophet, to our general authorities, and those on a local level, our state presidents and bishops. Next time you see them, I hope they're smiling and I hope they're having a good time. Now, David does offer to build the temple. He knows, I got the Ark of Covenant, I have to build a permanent place. And this is 2 Samuel chapter 7. He draws up plans. Here's how it should be built. He starts to get, I want to get all these things ready. But the Lord doesn't ask him to do it. It's going to be safe for his son. I'm not sure right now in the storyline he knows why. But there'll come a time where he finds out why. Particularly as he approaches the switch points of his life. Each one of us has switch points in our lives. And President Hinckley tells a great story a little bit about like a switch point on a railroad. And then applies it to our lives. 
President Hinckley taught. As he gave this example of how little decisions in life become very important. He talks about that there was an experience while he was working or at when he was working for a railroad company. He said he received a call from New Jersey that a passenger train arrived without the baggage car. Quote, We discovered that the train had been properly made up in Oakland, California and properly delivered to St. Louis, but in the St. Louis yards. A thoughtless switchman had moved a piece of steel just three inches. That piece of steel was a switch point, and the car that should have been in Newark, New Jersey, was in New Orleans, Louisiana, 1,300 miles away. So it is with our lives. A cigarette smoked, a can of beer drunk at a party, a shot of speed taken on a dare, a careless giving in to an impulse on a date. Each has thrown a switch in the life of a boy that put him on track, that carried him far away from what he might have been, a great and foreordained calling. And, as Nephi said, thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. In David's life, there are switch points. And at very first, they very easily could have been maneuvered a few inches and changed the outcome of his life. And one of the things that I do if I'm doing this in a class is I'll draw something like this up on the board or have this slide. Here are decisions that changed David's life, his direction. Here are some verses, and I have them just write out or in a scripture journal. All right, what did David do? And maybe what should he have done? So just start that out, and let's just go through it together. Here's what David did. Here's maybe what he could have done. Verse 1 came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Now pause, there's a battle. David's the king. David's in charge of the army. Where should he be? Well, he's not in the battle. David sent Job. Joab, his servants with him, and all Israel, everybody else is going except him. And they destroyed the children of Ammon. There's battle number one. And battle number two, besieged Rabbah. But... David's not where he's supposed to be. Had David just simply been where he was supposed to be, maybe this wouldn't have all happened. Maybe that is the way it is in our lives. If we go to the places where we probably should be, if we're going to church every Sunday, we're doing the small and simple things we should be doing, it prevents a lot of those switch points where we get off by just a degree. Verse 2, came to pass the evil time, even time. David arose from off his bed. Okay, great. He's walking around. And in the time of Jerusalem, David's time, on top of the roofs, they're flat. People would be up there, especially to catch a nice, cool summer breeze. It's a very common thing. He's up on the roof of the king's house. From the roof, now from his roof, you have the David's house, and there's the ravine. And going up on the other side, you have houses, and they're probably all crammed together quite close and there, going back to verse 2, from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. She thinks it's private, but it's really not. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So what should David have done? He sees the woman washing herself. Look away. Go back inside. Verse 3, and David sent and inquired after the woman. That's what he did. Should he have inquired? No. And one said, is this not Bathsheba? the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Even at this switch point, he should have said, hey, she's married. And David's already married. And for David sent messengers. He took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. What should David have done? Not send a messenger not kept that switch point going off world were way and more away. He shouldn't have had sex with her. Verse eleven or verse six. And David sent a Joab saying, Send me your eye the Hittite, because guess what? Bathsheba's pregnant. No, 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 that's not in verse six. But she is. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah was come to him, this is just Mr. Faithful. David demanded of how Joab did. How the people did. How the war prospered. I'm thinking, if I'm Uriah, the king wants me to deliver a report. I deliver the report. 
And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house, wash thy feet. Uh, you know, it's been a hard day. And Bathsheba's pregnant, and I want, don't want them to think I'm the one, so come back on military leave. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. However, verse 14, Uriah stays faithful. All my soldier buddies are out in the field. I'm going to be here where I'm supposed to be. This is my, my station. Came to pass the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it by the land, or hand of Uriah. He wrote in the letter saying, Send Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire you from him. Send him out. It's a lot of fighting. And Uriah is going to stay there and everybody else retreat. I know what's going to happen. That he may be smitten and die. Came to pass, Joab deserved city. Signed Uriah to a place where he knew the value men were. And when the city of the men, men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. What did David do? Well, he should have fessed up right then and there, but he doesn't. He's compounding one mistake with another. In verse 26 and 27, when Uriah of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her into his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the first thing that David had done, but the thing that David had done, had displeased the Lord. And it's a series of things. There are key words in the downfall of David. First, he wasn't in the right place at the right time. But the key words in verse 2, he saw, then he looked. It's, I see this girl, and now look, I'm longer, lingering a little bit too long. He inquired, he took, he lay. And I'm just thinking, what would happen if Joseph of Egypt was there? What advice would he have given David and Bathsheba about resisting temptation? Wouldn't it be awesome to have those two to have a conversation? One who was tempted every day, day after day, very forcefully, bluntly. And David, who was bored one day because he's not where he's in the right place, has one kind of thought to enter him, and he acts on it, and then he acts on that, and he acts on that. Well, maybe just think about in your life the blessing it's been when you resisted temptation like Joseph. That could be a great discussion right here, making that comparison, Joseph versus David. And think of how blessing it was to resist temptation. And then if you compare it to what happens with David, very difficult things are coming. I love what President Benson said about keeping the law of chastity. When it comes to the law of chastity, it is better to prepare and prevent than it is to repair and repent. Let me say that again. When it comes to the law of chastity, it's better to prepare and prevent than it is to repair and repent. Spencer W. Kimball made a note, uh, just an observation. David didn't fall with just one moment. He made, he made this observation. Likewise, adultery is not the result of a single thought. There first is a deterioration of thinking. Many sinful chain thoughts have been coursing through the offender's mind before the physical sin is committed. The devil knows how to destroy our young girls and boys. He may not be able to tempt a person to murder or commit adultery immediately, but he knows that if he can get a boy and a girl to sit in the lane, car lane late enough after the dance or park long enough in the dark at the end of the lane, the best boy, the best girl, will finally succumb and fall. He knows that all have a limit to their resistance. Elder Maxwell also observed, When we see each other in the morning, our sleep has often, been not, has often not been the same, even though we usually sleep, say the same good morning. Uriah apparently slept very well, when as a loyal lieutenant of King David, he slept with the servants on the floor at King David's door. Uriah was loyal to his men in the open fields, to his king and to his wife Bathsheba. By contrast, one cannot help but wonder how well the conspiracy and adulterous David slept that same night. The later lamentations of David suggest that many sleepless nights followed his sending of the uncompromised Uriah to his death in the forefront of the, of the hottest battle, where the valiant men were. Uriah fell, but David plummeted, plummeted from the privileged place reserved for him in the next world. Thus, 
there are certain mortal moments and minutes that matter, certain hinge points in the history of each human. Some seconds are so decisive that they shrink the soul, while other seconds are spent so as to stretch the soul. All of us have had switching points in our lives. Maybe think about some of the things that have happened in your life, your switch points. What have you learned from them? What have you learned by staying on course? And how blessed you are for doing it. Well, David is a lot like an ostrich. We'll call him this David the ostrich. He's done something wrong and all he wants to do is hide. David wants to hide his face in the sand. But you can't do that with the Lord. Elder Richard G. Scott, do not take comfort in the fact that your transgressions are not known by others. That is like an ostrich with his head buried in the sand. He sees only darkness and feels comfortably hidden. In reality, he is ridiculously conspicuous. Likewise, our every act is seen by our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son. They know everything about us. Well, for David, God sends the prophet, Nathan, and comes up and says, Hey, I got a parable for you. I don't know if he says a parable, but I got a story for you. There's a poor man in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3, who had nothing, save one ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up and grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come. Well, after hearing this story, David's incensed. Who is this rich man? You let me know who this is. I will take care of this because I'm King David and I want justice here. And the prophet turns to him and says, Thou art the man. You had so much given to you. And you took Bathsheba, someone else's wife. There are consequences for David. Nathan prophesies, The sword will not depart from David's house. The rest of your life, you're going to have a lot of bloodshed. Evil will rise up against you, David, out of your own family. Another consequence of what's, what you've done even though David's sins were done privately, the Lord's punishment would be made known to all Israel. Everybody's going to know what's happening to you. And the child that's going to be born of the adulterous relationship between you and Bathsheba is going to die. And you have other wives. They will become defiled before the people. Every single one of Nathan's prophecies are fulfilled. The prophecy in 2 Samuel 12, that the sword did not depart from uh, David's house, happens in 2 Samuel. There's just a bunch of his sons suffer violent deaths. Next prophecy in chapter 12, verse 11, evil will rise up from David's own family. The fulfillment is also in 2 Samuel. David's son Absalom rebelled and sought to overthrow his father. He even sought David's life. The other prophecy, verses 11 and 12, David's wives will be defiled before the people. It was the custom that when a man who took a wife of a formal king became the new king. Fulfillment, chapter 16. Absalom openly defiles ten of his father's wives. One of the other prophecies in verse 12, even though David's sins were private, he thought they were private, the Lord's punishment would be known to all Israel. In fulfillment, Absalom openly took David's concubines from him. And it's known publicly. The prophecy in verse 14, a child that was born of him and Bathsheba would die. The fulfillment, even though David spends a lot of time in prayer asking that the son would be able to live. He fasts for seven days. The child still dies. Now in the end, what's the end result of this tragedy? Elder Boyd K. Packer said, Forgiveness will come eventually to all her repentant souls who have not committed the unpardonable sin. Forgiveness does not, however, necessarily assure exaltation, as in the case with David. Elder McConkie added, as to the fact that the sealing power cannot seal a man up in eternal life if he has thereafter commits murder and thereby sheds innocent blood, the prophet says. A murderer, for instance, one that sheds innocent blood, cannot have forgiveness. David sought repentance at the hand of God carefully with tears 
for the murder of Uriah, but he could only get it through hell. He got a promise that his soul would not be left in hell. Thus, even though a man's calling election has been made sure, if he then commits murder, all the promises of the, are of no effect, and he goes to a telestial kingdom. Now, switching to Solomon. If you could have any wish, come on, you've all probably seen Aladdin. Genie comes out, bah, 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 singing, because it's Disney. You could have any wish, what would you want? Well, King Solomon's asked that. First Kings chapter 3. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Solomon, verse 9 says, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may deserve between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? God is very pleased with that request and gives him wisdom. King Solomon is known all around for his wisdom. And then there's an example, 1 Kings chapter 3. There are two women, they're harlots, and one of them was pregnant, had a baby, and now they're fighting over who is the mother. They come in front of Solomon, and they want to know. Solomon, judge between us which is the mother. And, verse 24, the king says, I've got the solution. Bring me a sword. They brought him a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child into two. Give half to one, half to the other. Then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O oh my lord, give her the living child, and no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it neither be mine nor thine, but divide it. The king Solomon so wise, he knows the love of a mother. Verse 27, Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. As his wisdom starts to spread, he also realizes that there is a temple. David was not allowed to build the temple, but it was also a desire of his. As Solomon becomes king, you know, and I'm just adding in a little bit of, of 1 Chronicles. Chapter 17, David, you can't build the temple. Chapter 22, David does everything he can to build the temple, to prepare for it. He doesn't actually start building it. He's getting things ready for it. I mean, he knows he can't build it, but he wants to prepare for it. And then in 1 Chronicles 28, Solomon is appointed to be the one who's in charge of building the temple. And Solomon has all these plans and all these materials courtesy of his dad. And I just kind of that question, how much did it cost to make Solomon's temple? Well, the materials for the permanent house of the Lord, known as Solomon's temple, were accumulated mostly by David. It's estimated that he gathered a total of 108,000 talents of gold, 10,000 darics of gold, and 1,017,000 talents of silver for the prospective structure and its furnishings. With these metals and other materials for which Solomon made arrangements, the king built the most lavish temple to the Lord. It was completed in seven and one-half years. All right. This is a little bit old. This is from the Sperry Symposium. But there's the math. Here's how much gold there was. In the end, Sidney B. Sperry says $39 billion, U.S. dollars worth of gold. Now, if you translate that, that was 1972. If you adjust that for inflation, that's $271 billion. $271 billion. Well, he gets going on the, on the temple. Seven and a half years he spends building a magnificent house to the Lord. And it's fully for the Lord. It is a great structure. And it's going to be there for a while. In verse, 1 Kings 7, I just point this out. You can read a lot of other things that happened with the, with the temple. A lot about what's inside it. But he makes a molten sea there. Ten cubits from one rim to the other. It was round all about. Its height was five cubits. Brim of it, there are 12 oxen, verse 25. Three looking north, three west, three south, three east. They're symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're upholding this ritual washing. It's not a baptismal font. They're doing ritual purifications. Verse 26. Here's how thick it was, and it contained 
2,000 baths, or about 11,600 gallons. It's huge. And it does remind us the tabernacle, of, or now Solomon's temple then, is pointing forward towards the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Temples today, the way they're designed and built, teach and testify of the atonement, of the greatness of Jesus Christ, and give us a way of pointing us back on how Christ helps us to come back into the Father. Now, the temple takes seven and a half years to build, but Solomon spends 13 years on his palace. Now I realize the seven and a half years, he had some of the things that were all prepared for him, but you think almost twice as long he takes to build his incredibly lavish home. Well, chapter 8, and that's kind of a little bit of a, hey, here's what's going to happen in Solomon. Temple's dedicated in 1 Kings chapter 8, and I just love what the Lord does for them. Verse 10, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Everyone knows what this symbolism is. This cloud of smoke by day is symbolic. The presence of God is here. God's accepting this temple dedication. This is now his house. This temple is now the intersection of earth and heaven. So verse 11, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of God had filled the house of the Lord. There have always been promises for the temple. Section 95 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 8 says, I design to endow those whom I have chosen in the temple with power from on high. Verse 90, chapter, section 97, two sections later, that they may be perfected in the temple in the understanding of their ministry, in theory, in principle, and doctrine. And a couple verses later, Yea, and my presence shall be there in the temple today. For I will come unto into it, and all the pure in heart that shall come into it shall see God. But if it be defiled, I will not come unto it. Just as it was true in that day, day of Solomon, it's true of temples today. And then chapter 9, Solomon, I love the warning, the Lord is working so hard with him. He says 1, 2, and 3. Well, verse 2, the Lord appears to Solomon the second time. This tells you a lot about who he is, that the Lord appears a second time. Verse 3, the Lord says, I've heard your prayer. And I've hallowed. The word hallowed means something becomes hallowed with the presence of God. So God had visited that house, therefore that building, Solomon's temple, had become hallowed, this house, which thou was built to my name. Mine eyes and mine heart shall be there in this temple perpetually. And now, this is for you, Solomon, if you'll keep walking before me. Then, verse 5, I'll establish your kingdom forever. But, verse 6, if you turn away from me, you don't have that promise. Then, verse 7, I will cut off Israel. Well, as he goes, he starts to have incredible visitors, including the Queen of Sheba, who visits him for his knowledge, his wisdom. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices very sore. Precious stones. There came no more such an abundance of spices as these, which the Queen of Sheba gave unto Solomon. Now the value of talent, one talent of gold today, as I looked it up on the website, two million dollars per talent of gold. She gives, uh, oh, 120 talents. I only did 20. So instead of 40 million, that's a lot more. That's how much gold she gives. Didn't do the math right there. But, verse 14, the weight of gold, just gold alone, that comes into Solomon every year is 600. Got a six. Three score. A score is 20 times three is six. And six talents. Six Six, six. I don't think it's a coincidence that that's how much he's getting every year. Now, if you have $2 million per talent, and you have 666 talents coming in every year, that is one, I got to do this, hundreds, thousands, million, billion, $1.3 billion a year is coming in in gold. And Solomon has a switch point. I mean, think about it. If you had a million dollars, how'd you spend it? How to change your life. Here's how it changes his. 1 Kings 11 verse 13, 
Okay, chapter 11, 1 through, 1 through 3. King Solomon loved many strange women. Now, this isn't strange that they're just a little bit different, a little bit odd. They are people who do not follow after God. They have uh, other gods. That's the strangeness. Together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidomites, the Hittites, and the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall thou come in to you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God, Solomon, clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Section 132, verse 38, has this great little side. David received many wives and concubines, and also Solomon, Moses, my servants, and also as many of my servants from the beginning of creation till this time, and in nothing did they sin, save in those things which they received not of me. See, I know at least some of these were approved. But, chapter 1 Kings 11, you start to see that switch point in Solomon's life. He loves wealth, and his wives turn him away from God. So, verse 4, came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart from after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Verse 6, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as David his father. Verse 9, And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And if you just summarize and look at the fall of these kings, going back to King Saul, what was his downfall, his switch point? His pride, his jealousy. Next, King David. He falls because of his lustful desires, law of chastity. And I probably should have put up the murder of her. Um, okay, yeah, and I forgot. Um, Uriah, King Solomon, his switch point comes with riches, fame, and honor. And it turns him away from God. Now, you just think about the king of kings. He was faced with all three of these temptations. When he has had his 40 days, 40 nights, he's been fasting. Satan takes him to the top of the temple and tempts him. If thou be the son of God, you got to prove it. You got your pride. Jump off. The angel will save you. He's tempted with pride. Did not give in. He's tempted with the appetites of the body to make bread. He was tempted with riches and fame and honor the world by Satan. But he did not give in. As in Alma chapter 7 verse 11, my all-time favorite verses testifies, he, Christ, suffered pains, afflictions, and temptations of every kind. And in section 20 of Doctrine and Covenants, he suffered temptations but gave no heed to them. He didn't even pay attention to them wasn't like David, where he saw, and then it's like, okay, I'm going to look some more and give heed and ponder it. He gave no heed to it. Well, may we take Christ as our example. In all the temptations we have in our life, even the most difficult, give no heed to them. Hey, just so you know, next time we're going to talk about the split of Israel to kingdoms, two kingdoms, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, or tribe of Judah, tribe of Israel. Now, just some teaching thoughts. There are those that may be around that want to study the ark or have. Help them. Help them understand. Maybe if they're a little bit ignorant, unknowing, here's why we have inspired prophets, leaders. And all of us have switch points in life. Small decisions that change the direction of our life. If you're if a President Uchtdorf fan like I am, it's that one degree when the plane's flying that got off course. It's a switch point. Look for the switch points in your lives this week. What's the switch point that's going to read you a little bit more to the Savior? Look for that switch point and act on it. Christ is tempted with life's greatest temptations. He can help us this week overcome the temptation that we have. Hey, thank you so much for spending some time with me as we've studied in Samuel and Kings. I hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling.